Welcome to the Startup Grind. So, without further ado, we've got Brandon and Jared Rodman of Weave. Everyone, let's get Thank you, everybody. You're worth it. Are you blushing? I'm always this color. He has a sunburn. So, so you guys are brothers. Correct. Thank you. I did a little bit of research before. <laughs> so I want to I want to hear as much about you as uh, tonight as with, you know to the same proportion that we talk about weave. And, and so, you know, let's start with some of the formative stories, either growing up or your first entrepreneurial experience. Like, um, what was growing up life like for the two of you? So, the, we've actually been asked this question quite a bit lately from investors and different people, but um, the first thing that I can remember that Jared and I did together was, it was, I can't remember exactly how old we were, but we were both really young. Um, we, when we grew up, we didn't have a lot of money growing up. Yeah. And so to make money for Christmas, we actually, our dad took us to some property that our family, like distant relatives owned or something. Okay. Um, and we took 22 rifles and shot mistletoe out of trees. And then we t picked up the mistletoe and bundled it up with yeah. garbage bag ties. Okay. And then we went door to door and sold them and made money for Christmas. And who was the better shot between the two of you? Uh, he was, I've he's always, always been, been a better person. shot, but I'm a better salesperson, so it all, <laughs> That's a great it team. all balances out. So. Awesome. So, so why do investors want to hear that story? Like, why, are, why is everyone asking you about growing up? Um, so specifically, one of the groups, Andreessen Horowitz, that we met with uh, recently, they really like to know what makes the founders tick. Yeah. And partnerships and the relationship that the founders have it, it really gets stressed yeah. through a startup because it's not it's not always great. In fact, ninety five percent of the time, it's the hardest thing you can do. Yeah. Um, so that's really important to them. So they want to see what that relationship is made of. So in between the two of you, what like how do you behave when things get stressful? Uh, I so I think Brandon actually behaves significantly better than I do. Uh, I tend to kind of just break things down and say, okay, how can I fix it? Yeah. And he's like, okay, well, let's uh, just look for a better solution. He gets it. Yeah, so. Um, Actually, I, I think I leave for a little while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just go on a walk. I, I have to remove myself. That's fair. Go golfing or go riding my bike or something. Okay. Yeah. All right, so, I, I mean, you guys sold mistletoe door to door. Uh, what else have you sold door to door? Uh, he's, he's done more of the door to door than I have. Yeah, so I spent six years doing summer sales yeah. here. Um, work for, yeah, you guys heard of that? <laughs> um, I sold satellite TV okay. and in the last two years um, I sold Comcast. Okay. So, so that's a you know highly commission based mm -hmm. business model and so to do it for six years uh, it had to be worth it each year to come back. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I think you reach like a, summer yeah. sales in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> you reach a point that it's like, okay, I, I, I've had enough, and then the next summer comes around, you get sucked back in. So <laughs> it's kind of, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's basically you go two months, you're okay. Month three, you're questioning, why did I do this? Month four, you're ready to quit. Yeah. And then you go five months of not doing it, mm -hmm. and you forget how crappy it is. But you remember the money you made. So then you're like, I think I can do that again. Yeah. <laughs> It's a vicious cycle. That's how you fall into that trap. So, Learned a lot from it, though. Yeah. It's great for uh, starting a company. So now, Jared, talk, so you're not the summer sales type? No, I've done summer sales. Okay. So I've had jobs since I've been 12, right. paper routes. I've done construction, landscaping, just about everything. Yeah. When I moved here to Utah, because we're originally from Oregon, uh -huh. um, I started doing sales, so a lot of phone sales. Um, I've worked for just about every company possible, uh, some that I would like to mention because I'm embarrassed, but okay. um, as a whole, I, I just learned, so door-to-door -door is, in my per from my perspective, very different than phone sales, and so I was able to kind of weigh those, and I, I have a lot more experience on the phone side versus summer, so 
did the summer, I was not as invested. Started mm -hmm. a little late in the game, and uh, yeah, so cool. prefer the uh, film side. And so, how much have you guys stuck together on these different jobs? Have you guys, you know, brought each other into different companies and followed? And he's he's usually he'll have some crazy brand idea. And, uh -huh. Hey, you should come do this. I'm like, All right. okay, I'll help you out, uh, kind of thing. But I've been fortunate enough and, and lucky on uh, this most recent one. We started. It was uh, so he's always wanted to do some like extra stuff, and so when he finished summer sales, he started a, a nonprofit organization called Nets for Africa, where essentially gathering money so we could purchase nets for kids in Africa fight malaria. And so I helped him out a little bit with that. Mm -hmm. And, and that's kind of we, what we fought. utterly failed. Yes, at raising failed. Money. So, so what, what defines failure for you? Like you say you failed. What does that mean? You get no money. <laughs> <laughs> no nets for Africa. Money to buy no nets. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the funny thing about uh, nonprofit is it actually takes a lot of money to run it. <laughs> and so you reach a point that that money actually goes into getting nets, but there's a huge jump where it's really tough. And yeah. so um, the great thing we actually learned from that is some uh, really good software and things that actually moved us into the other venture. So um, I actually was getting married about that time to my wife, and um, yeah, it, I was like, okay, I'll do school or this, and then Brandon just out of Zadik started what started as uh, called Recall Solutions. It's basically a, a call center we schedule over to patients with dental offices. Okay. And so that's that's kind of where I hopped on. So those other ventures. I mean, we've been brothers. I've always been a shadow, so to speak. Our mm -hmm. mom jokes about it, but that's kind of where work kind of came together was that first Recall Solutions. Okay, so as a shadow, uh, you know, do you find you, you play a different role as far as more supportive or? Yeah, we, we complement each other really well. I, I tend to be more analytical and I like processes and systematic type things where looking at something of, you know, like our organization yeah. and looking at it as cogs and wheels and making sure it goes well. And I tend to be, he jokes about this, I tend to be more pessimistic. He, he likes to say he's realistic. Right, right. But yeah. that's not true. He's <laughs> <laughs> pessimistic. Yeah. So I'm the, I'm the type that's always like, okay, so those goals look good, but worst case, what's going to happen? Uh -huh. And then I, if worst case looks great, I'm like, okay, cool, let's do it. <laughs> Where he's like, oh yeah, we'll raise five million. And I'm just like, okay, yeah, right. And then sure enough, he gets <laughs> so, so there, there's some compliments there as far as uh, making sure there's checks and balances, so to speak. But no, I, I, I without question, it works well. So Brandon, when you've got your brother shooting down your ideas. <laughs> How do you combat that? I'm pretty stubborn. Okay. So I just don't stop talking about it. Okay. And I usually think I'm right. I'm, I'm, but I'll admit when I'm wrong. So, and I've been wrong a lot. Um, but I just keep pushing forward with it. And eventually, uh, if if talking through it, we learn if it's the right thing or not. Yeah. You got you got to look at it from all aspects. Well, that's usually what it is. At a certain point, I'm like, okay, no, I I can. See your vision I can understand what you're saying and so I'm just the one that's a little bit slower to, to lead towards it, but it so how long does this dialogue carry on before you guys actually spend your first dollar I don't think it really ever ends I mean literally I don't know how many times a day one of us uh, like if I'm on the phone he comes mm -hmm. and he's like hurry up come in I want to talk to you I got some likewise I go in all the time and he's he gets annoyed because I'll go in he's talking to somebody I'll just go sit down and just wait so. <laughs> but no it really never ends and so I think that's where the, the synergy really happens is being able to bounce ideas off mm -hmm. and having somebody, fortunately, being brothers, right. we haven't had those conflicts and our personality types, I don't know if we really will, um, but we're able to say the hard things and not be offended. So you're telling me straight up, like, no, you need to quit thinking so realistically, negatively, uh, or, or whatever it is. Right. And at the flip side, I'll be like, okay, you show me the numbers and so I mean, these are a lot of really positive things about working with families and just startups. Um, I've heard some really negative things also uh, about like you know don't go into business with a friend and don't go into business with family. And uh, so you guys somehow have either mitigated and steered around these uh, challenges, um, or you just haven't hit them yet. So well, we, what is we've it? definitely hit them. Yeah. Five and a half years of bootstrapping a company. Um, we'll do that to you. Yeah. So obviously, starting a company, you have no money. If you haven't started a company and successfully exited 
that company. No one wants to give you money to fund your company. And so you figure out how to be scrappy and being scrappy, trying to figure out, solve those problems, um, not just problems with the business, but problems with your life uh -huh. because you don't have any money to support uh, your family. Um, it, it's really stressful. It's hard. But I think what it, what it really comes down to, you know, for us, I think, honestly, the best people to go into business with are people that you know really well. Okay. Um, because you know what they're made of. You know how they're going to react mm -hmm. in a stressful situation. Um, so, uh, Izeni, um, Gabe actually forgot to mention what they actually do. Um, it was intentional. I think we've got enough marketing around. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, these guys, you know, started their company, the brothers, and these guys have done an amazing job. Um, actually, if it wasn't for them and the software development that they've done for us, then we wouldn't have what we have today. So, but I, I really think friends and family um, are good people to do business with. Yeah. Um, with, within reason. I mean, so sometimes it's a bad situation, but sometimes it's good. So, have you seen in meeting with investors that relationship of being brothers hurt you in any cases? No. It hasn't hurt at us at all. That's awesome. So, um, let's go to what formal training have you guys had? Door-to-door -door sales. No. Okay. Uh, no, uh, so you over BYU, marketing and advertising. Yeah, I took the 10-year uh, college you know, roadmap. Uh, He's a doctor. No. <laughs> got, got my undergraduate. Spent lots of time there. No, so I started at BYU in 1999. Um, served a mission after that, came back in 2002, and then uh, got into marketing and advertising into the communications program there. Uh -huh. um, but then started doing summer sales, and I was making great money. I had a hard time justifying finishing school really quickly and yeah. sacrificing work and the way things were going. And so it took me quite a while to get my degree. Finally got my degree in 2010. Okay. So it was actually 11 years. Solid 11 <laughs> years. Exactly. Um, and then just the training of starting a company, uh, learning everything on the job. There, yeah. there is no training to run a company. Um, you have to learn it on the job. So. And then for yourself, Jared? Uh, similarly, I uh, about eight years, so a little Solid bit better. Years. <laughs> Learned a little bit from them. Didn't take as long. No, I uh, University of Utah. Um, uh -huh. uh, had different plans originally, but um, ended up uh, philosophy major. Okay. It was really tough. Going great startup prep. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and really, reason being is I just wanted to get done. So okay. I was going through some other majors and uh, obviously a huge opportunity, and I was like, okay, let's just get finished, and it worked out. <laughs> so, what so, were your what were your other plans initially? Looking in. Um, I w because I am a little more analytical. I actually uh, looked at uh, kind of a science uh, degree and going into law school. Uh -huh. So, and then I switched to philosophy, knowing maybe I could. It's actually funny. Enough. I don't know if Gabe remembers. I had a conversation at one point because they were in helping us out, and I just asked them. I said, "So, just straight up, like, opportunity of you know, just learning and growing. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't." This was back in probably '09, and uh, or going to school and having you know on paper looking. Good. Yeah. I was like, "Oh, experience, no question." So I was like, "Okay." So I, I started looking further, and then as we moved in, thanks, Gabe. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't talk him into it, but you're. <laughs> But obviously, you know, uh, checked with my wife, and, and you know, it just made sense, and we kind of went all in at that point, and that was when we were still just solely focused on the, the after hours scheduling service, mm -hmm. and then things platformed, and obviously, I made the right decision. So. Awesome. So, what would be your like? If you, our audience and I were of all students, and what would you tell them as far as balancing opportunities with work with finishing and getting their degree? Uh, I think it's a, you have to look at it, what is school going to get for you? I think it's important to get an education. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to go through school, I think it's important to get your degree, um, but what are you going to do with that? How is that going to help you in life to find a job, to support your family, yeah. um, do those kind of things? So you really have to question that. Um, sometimes you just need to get through school as quickly as you possibly can, yeah. because you need to get on with life, and maybe that whatever you're studying, you really like, but it's not going to impact your job search. Um, so it, it, it's a hard decision. So yeah. there's a lot of people that, um, 
actually, I, I can't remember who the investor is, but there's some investors that try to push people away from going to school to start companies. Yeah. Because you learn a lot starting a company. Real, cost about real the same. Um, yeah, it costs about the same. Exactly. So there's arguments for both sides. Uh, I was going to say there's probably no right answer to that. Yeah. Say so follow your passion. I mean, I've spoken with a lot of people that uh, they go through the motions of school wish they had and others that yeah. wish they had and so I think it's uh, to each his own and, and again it is that end point where you want to be because some places yeah school it's, it's the right choice yeah others it still can be the right choice but as Brandon said get through it and then start just working hard so. yeah so from the attic you're, you're, you've got this idea and you're pitching your brother you talk about it every day you finally decide to spend some money on it and uh, tell, tell me about hiring first employee and what that was like so he actually wasn't the first employee okay. when when this started it was the fundraising didn't work and what did so, you try to do uh we just kind of split up yeah um i think school started back up for him and i just i had i think we had one child at the time yeah we just had our oldest um and I was trying to figure out what to do next. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was some software that Jared and I had used uh, to speed dial through lists. You, you upload an Excel file with a list of names and yep. phone numbers and plug in your headphones, put your credit card in there, and click dial, yeah. and it would charge you per minute. But you could be much more efficient in calling. Um, and that was pretty new back in 2008. And so I looked at that, and I thought, okay, I, I can <laughs> sell something. I just need to figure out what to sell. Yeah. I have the tools now. You know, I don't have to invest in a bunch of infrastructure to have this capability. Um, I just didn't know what to sell. And then I came home one day, and my wife had heard of an idea from somebody who used to work in a dental office. Yeah. And um, heard of the idea that she had just had a child, and she was calling, still working for the dental office. Um, at least this is my understanding of it. She was still working for the dental office and scheduling appointments for them, yeah. but working from home. And our mom's a hygienist. I have a bunch of friends who were in dental school at the time. I at one time wanted to be a dentist. Um, and so, like, everything kind of clicked. It yeah. sounded like the right thing. It felt right. And so I thought, okay, I just need to get lists of dentists. Or you need to get lists from dentists of their patients they can't get a hold of. I'll upload it into this software, mm -hmm. and I'll start dialing. And so I did the first, you know, little bit of dialing, and then... Uh, hired our first employee, and we do the calling in the evening, and literally we'd be sitting down to dinner, and our employee would walk up the stairs to the attic, and then she'd come down every once in a while and be like, hey, I have a problem. Um, I think the internet's not working. So the calls were over the internet. Yeah. And so I'd be doing dishes or something, and you know, run up and help her and list the calls, make sure everything was working right. Um, but eventually, after about two months or so, we moved out of the attic, and an office space at that point Jared jumped over and no I was in the attic for a little bit oh yeah you were yeah, just the, right, right before so <laughs> you know, I remember that it was hot up there it was like dead summer and man yeah it was pretty warm no it's I think towards the tail end so September and then October I have done and no because I started working from home for a little bit I helped you guys some initial oh, yeah. calling okay so I was doing cold call lead gen yeah wow that was tough try cold calling a dental office you're not going to get through to anybody I promise <laughs> Um, and uh, so I did that for a little bit, and I got one <laughs> sale. That was my uh, crowning moment. They're still with us, surprisingly. Wow. Five and a half years later. So the uh, amount of revenue we pulled in, it was definitely worth it. But, um, yeah, no, I remember then, yeah, transitioned over to a place over in technically American Fork, mm -hmm. which is on the west side of uh, the 500 exit. That worked for a couple of years. Yeah. So the work-life balance when work is at home? Talk Talk to me about like, I mean, you go up the stairs and you're... Work and life blend. Yeah. You try to live your life while you're working somehow. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's hard, but um, I think I've figured out how to adapt to it. I think it's been a harder adjustment for my wife um, because you, you got to respond to customers and employees at all times of the day. Um, so it's hard to have that division of, you know, when do you put your phone down and don't check it and you know it's hard but it's it's definitely doable so what are your rules when do you put your phone down um when he goes to bed 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. When it needs charged. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I try. I'm not very good at it, but I try between the hours of about 5.30 and 6 okay. until kids are in bed, 7.30, 8 o'clock. I try not to have my phone at all. Um, not very good at it, though. My, my wife's shaking her head like, not <laughs> 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 So what about for yourself? How do you manage? Uh, it's, it's sometimes workload. So it depends on the day, of course. Um, sure. A lot of times, I literally, you're not even able to look at your email. You get home and it's like, oh wow, I have 35 emails I have to reply to. And it's, uh, I, you know, erring on the side of quality over quantity, go through each. And so I've had multiple times, again, same thing. I'm like, hey, I can't talk right now, I gotta work. And it's like a regularly six to nine window when I get mm -hmm. home. It's nice, I'll throw basketball on or watch a show or sure. something and reply to emails. So it's one of those also on the weekends. It's been nice to hire some amazing employees to help out with things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for a while, it's like you're on call 24-7, especially as we transition to the physical phone service. Uh, when phones go down, I mean, crap, it's the fan. It, like, people freak out. Do not want uh, phones going down. So um, fortunately, we haven't had very many instances. It's more network-based, but we'd be able to coordinate with them even on a Saturday or Sunday. Yeah. But it, I mean, that's kind of what the job requires for a little bit. So. so let's go back. So moving in out of the attic now, um, you guys are building a, at what point do we transition away from just scheduling calls to, you know, this idea, when, when did this idea morph? So I'm just naturally a tinker. I don't stop trying to figure out how to optimize things or how to make things cooler and better and more efficient. Um, so we kept playing with the idea mm -hmm. of how can we schedule more appointments faster, um, how can we keep our customers happier, how can we keep them longer as a customer. Because one of the problems we faced, a dentist has a list of patients, but that, pa that patient list ends at some point. Right. And after you call those patients enough times, they start getting pretty frustrated. So we then would lose a customer. And um, so we had to figure out ways to do that to keep them instead of from six months, how can we keep them for 12 months mm -hmm. or, or you know 18 months and you know prolong that so we could build this company into something. And uh, it was the process of trying to solve all the problems that we faced from that scheduling service that eventually, you know, over time we started building what was the beginning of we. Okay. Um, at least the concept of it. Um, there were some other problems that we faced. Uh, when we would call patients, we'd call them in the evening, yeah. and the patients would think we worked for the dental practice. We'd use the dental practice's caller ID number. Yeah. The dentist, dental office knew this. We were a part-time employee for that dental office. Um, but then when the employees got to the office the next day, they would start calling through some of their lists, and sometimes it would overlap. They'd call somebody who just got called the night before or two nights before, and the person in the dental office would feel like an idiot. Right. Because they didn't know, and the person on the line is frustrated, saying, "You guys just called me. Why are you calling me again?" Um, and so we had to figure out a way to sync up those call records. And we knew with a handful of customers, it's pretty easy to send that email every night. Yeah. You know, pull that list and do that. Um, but once you get 100 customers, 200 customers, 1,000 customers, you have to have software to do it. So we had to figure out a way to automate that if we were going to scale the company. And so it was just solving those problems over and over again was how we and that was the, started doing that. Towards end of 2009 into 2010-ish, kind of in that area where I think the first product was called Schedule Max. And it, it's funny, if he ever looks back at some of his old designs, it's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I thought of it. You know, kind of, it's funny. Uh, it's like an old car I, you never... I think that one still looks pretty good, though. <laughs> uh, um, still right. <laughs> uh, and really, uh, again, shout out to Izeni. That's they actually, funny enough, and a lot of it's you think of coincidence. I mean, we've been very fortunate. Some of it, you just have to look back and just be like, wow, that's yeah. so lucky, so to speak. But um, they had worked with a group across the hall, and so Brandon uh, threw out the idea, and um, they helped us build a database for our, you know, sending reports out, and then that all went into. Uh, I mean, what came, what became our phone system? Yeah. But it started out as well. Let's create a system where they can use it, and automate scheduling, etc. And so, um, it eventually, it just was like, why don't we just do a phone system? Mm -hmm. Granted, not knowing how hard it was, we said, oh sure, why not? You know, <laughs> and uh, so that was your job was to 
really look at these ideas and know how hard they he are. He sold me. I mean, <laughs> it was there. Okay. That's, that's why a lot of startups are started by young people, because yeah. we're naive. There you go. We and, and it we really can't be a blessing. It really can't. I mean, having that, uh, that level of just not knowing brought us to where we are. And in real life, throughout that process, we've had some hard times, but uh, as Brandon's kind of alluded to, you just work hard, you push through it. If the solution's not working, try to try to look and see how you can change it, fix it, or is there a better solution? Mm -hmm. So talk to me about that model. So I don't know either of your technical levels, but uh, bringing in a Pretty third zero. Okay, so yeah, it's about a point zero one five ish kind of. Definitely know where I'm, we don't program. Okay, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, so you guys but you got learned a lot down. of the trade, you know, as far as networking, kind of how in, you know a network goes. But. So instead of building the product in house, you you took it outside. What are the challenges for someone who's looking to do the same thing that they should be aware of? Um, money. Okay. That's going to be cost. Yeah, one of the hardest things. That's why a lot of people bring it in house, find a co-founder who knows how to code. Yep. And they do it that way. Um, so part of our story was we didn't have any money at that point. Um, so literally, we are really grateful to Izeni. I think it was, they might have had three, two other employees at the time. Um, and I had, I believe it was $16,000 in an IRA. Okay. That's all I had left. Um, talked to my wife. I somehow talked her into emptying that out. <laughs> And then I wasn't I, scared for it. No. I sat down with Gabe and Jordan <laughs> for my Zenny and was literally like, "This is what I have. Uh -huh. What can we build? And <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to get more money. I promise." And for some reason, they believed the story that I told. Yeah. And um, I, we've paid a lot of money since then, and <laughs> we're, we're, we're happy to have done that. Um, but I think. You have to find people to believe in you. Yeah. You have to surround yourself with as many people like that as possible because it's really, really hard. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't tell people how hard it really is until they experience it. Um, it's probably one of the scariest things you can do. So, what is uh, so you guys have now you got that product built, and you recently gone through raising, you know, some additional funding. Uh, what's that process like? So, I really exciting and giddy at times, and <laughs> really, uh, no, literally, like after meetings, you're just like, that was so, you know, kind of, yeah. thing. or getting to meet some people that you never thought you'd get to meet. It's just, it's from my perspective, it's been a blast, and I, I'm excited for. for yeah, more. he was only in the meetings after Y Combinator. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, I didn't go to the ones where he failed, and people were like, you're an idiot, you know, kind yeah. of thing. <laughs> Is it pretty brutal? Uh, it can be. Yeah. It's it's really uh, hard. Yeah. It's the it's the grind. Um, there you go. Little plug for you guys. Thank you. Um, so I remember one time early on. I I don't even think we were a fully fledged phone company at the time. Uh, we were forwarding calls and we never felt comfortable really pulling the trigger and becoming the full phone company for a dental office, but. I pitched to, I think, the Utah Angels, okay. um, the original group uh, that's no longer around, but um, went and pitched to them. I, and I was at this one. It was pretty He, he was there. Oh, yeah. Everything failed. Like, I couldn't even get the projector hooked up. I looked like the <laughs> biggest idiot. Um, and I, I bet they were all there thinking, like, this company's never going to make it. Yeah. Um, and leaving there thinking, like, I had my shot. Mm -hmm. I had my shot to get some money, and we could... You know, pay for some more development. Um, we could hire more people. We could do stuff with that money, um, and it didn't work out. And I pitched to the Park City Angels. Um, that one went a little bit better. I talked to a couple people, but nothing from it. Okay. And so you kind of get this. You get led along a lot of the way. Even uh, two months before Y Combinator, before we even applied to Y Combinator mm -hmm. and been accepted. Um, got rejected by investors. Um, you know, they were nice about it. They're not being mean. Right. But it's really hard when you have this company that you believe in this idea, and when you talk to your customers, you know that this is going to be successful. Yeah. And to try to get people to believe that, 
that's really hard. When they don't, it you know it hurts. Um, going through Y Combinator, Y Combinator was an interesting experience because everything that Y Combinator does, I believe you can do on your own. Um, you don't have to have Y Combinator to be a successful company. Right. Um, but they give you such a you know small window, about three months, to hyper focus on you know getting your product and then getting customers and growth. And fortunately, we already had a product. Yeah. We had customers, um, but uh, so all we had to focus on was growth. And because we hadn't had money for so long, we knew everything we would do if we got money. That's cool. And so when we got a little bit of money through Y Combinator, we started testing these things that we thought we wanted to do, yeah. and everything worked. And so when we exited Y Combinator, we had grown an average of 38% month over month. Wow. Um, we went from, I think, 160 customers um, before Y Combinator. It took us about two years to get 160 customers. Yep. In the third month um, in Y Combinator, we signed up. I think it was 162 customers in that one month alone. Um, it's a funny statistic to look at. It's like, wow, uh, one month we just double. <laughs> so, you know. And so that, that changes the whole conversation with investors. When you, you can experience hyper growth, yeah. they they see you're on to something there's you know proof of that um, having Y Combinator as a supporter it helps a lot too but that part's invaluable I mean their mantra is build something people want right I think that's really at the core is as you listen to your customers and improve listen improve and uh, you know just go from there as Brandon's saying a lot of that you can do uh, the thing that's invaluable is they know everybody it's it's Yes, exactly. And so given that opportunity, that's what I saw as hugely beneficial is we knew what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And what was really interesting is our application we submitted to Y Combinator, um, we thought it, our whole pitch and view on it would have changed significantly. But we read it on towards the last week, last day-ish kind of thing. And we were giving the exact same pitch as we did in that uh, application. And that, that surprised me because I know yeah. we've grown so much, you know. Um, but really... It, I mean, it's a testament brand. I mean, he just kind of knew his product and you know, what he, where he wanted it to go, but that opportunity and connections were huge. So. Okay, one last question, and I'm going to open it up to you guys. We're going to get some questions from the audience before we close. Uh, what's next? Rule the world. Yeah. Now, um, to be quite honest, for me, I think what's next is building an iconic company. Um, we're not... I have no intention of selling the company. Yeah, I really don't. Um, you know, a lot of people say that, and a lot of people change their minds when certain numbers get presented to them. Mm -hmm. So I never know what will happen. But you're my, pretty stubborn. I, I am stubborn. So what's really important to me, though, is building a company that people are proud to work for. Yeah. That people look forward to coming to every day. They're presented with unique challenges. Um, they're proud to tell their friends and family that they work for a company like Weave. So building that is really what's next for me. But the way we get there is we build a really good product, we listen to our customers, we provide really good customer service, mm -hmm. um, and we uh, sell a bunch of accounts. We get lots of people on board. Um, if we do those things, we can then build that kind of a company. So. Anything to add to that? No. Awesome. <laughs> Guys, let's, let's give it up for these two. All right, so we're going to take just a few questions. Uh, a couple things just to keep in mind. Uh, questions are not pitches for your own ideas. And uh, keep it to one question, no follow-up questions. So with that in mind, um, I saw your hand first. Yeah, thank you. Can you tell us a little bit more about the, the sign-up process? I, I mean, I can go look online for it, but was there anything unique that you guys did? Are you a dentist? Because I can no, sorry, literally I show you. I'm just kidding. I'm totally messing. Sorry, sorry the, uh, Just repeat the question for like, the camera. How did you, from being in Utah especially? Like, yeah, so he's asking, what's the process like of applying for Y Combinator? Um, so Y Combinator, twice a year, they have an open open application. You literally just go online and you fill out an application. They ask you questions like, um, who are your co-founders? How long have you known each other? Um, what's your idea? Are you willing to change your idea if we don't like it? Um, things like that. 
and you just fill out the application and click submit. And then, then you wait. <laughs> and you, you hope you get called for an interview. Because highly you, recommend if doing that, reach out to somebody you know that's either applied or um, kind of knows because, uh, I mean, th there is a little bit of, they look for certain things, certain criteria, you know, <coughs> uh, because again, the, the founders and kind of the relationship, they do look at that. Um, but uh, well, why, guy, he, he'll give us some, some input. Why Combinator has invested in, I believe, close to 700 companies. And I think almost every batch of applications, they get close to 3,000. I know it grows every uh, time. And so they're seeing all these applications. They're interviewing you know, over 300 companies or so each time. And they accept all these companies into the group. And they see the companies that grow and the companies that struggle. And the companies that go on to be big, huge successes and the ones that don't. So they have a lot of data points that they're looking at in their decision-making process. So they, they look for specific things. But yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, let's go over here. So today at the Seed Summit, um, UA2 was there. And they brought up the point. They actually brought you guys up specifically saying. Uh, they're, they're investors. Well, yeah, so the point they brought up that they turned you guys down at a $7 million valuation and then had to turn around and actually invest at $35 million. To like five months later. Yes. <laughs> and having to throw yourself on their altar and beg for money and all those types of things, and they turn you down. How good does it feel to go back to them later with a 7x valuation and saying, now you can invest in me? I mean, honestly, how good does it feel? <laughs> so it, it felt really good. It was, it was pretty cool. But I, I really liked the guys. We stayed in contact all throughout. It was never a negotiation that, you know, I feel like you guys are trying to you know, shortchange our company, you guys don't catch the vision. I th they saw that vision early on, um, but everybody wants a good deal, and if there's not a lot of, you know, traction around that investment deal, then, you know, why, why would you invest at a higher, uh, you know, value than you need to? So one of the things that Y Combinator actually professes, and we, we saw it work to our favor, is when you try to fundraise, you want to try to fundraise from as many investors in as short a time of period as possible concurrently because you want a bidding process you want them to know that they need to jump quickly and they need to pony up um, if they want to be a part of the deal so that that's what changed we had some evidence we grew a ton we grew you know from 160 customers to over 400 customers in a matter of three months so that that changes the conversation too so but it, it did feel good I mean, for them, it's like, okay, if I give you my money, is it actually going to... And then as we started to show that growth, it was easier for them to say yes, even at that valuation. But of course, on the flip side, it's like, sorry, guys, you should have invested at the other, you know, so that part was kind of fun to, you know, poke them with, so. <laughs> now let's go here, then back over here. Now that you've taken money, and I mean, obviously you're trying to get it earlier on, do you feel like you took it on at the right time? Do you wish you would have gotten it earlier or later? And what's, you know, how does it feel, you know, now that you kind of have some other people to report to? In hindsight, and that we've been able to, you know, feed our families, we feel like we took it at the right time. But in the moment, we, we felt desperate. We needed money then. Um, everything happened to work out. I think it's because we don't, you, you mentioned, you know, that we're stubborn. We are. And we just didn't give up. We didn't quit. We, we believed in what we were doing. Um, and so, but yeah, I, I think we took it at the right time. I think there was probably like a six month window, if not maybe a little bit more before we actually got into Y Combinator that our whole vision and everything hadn't really changed at all. So I personally feel even if we had received it a little bit earlier, we still would have followed that same trajectory. And then we got one right here. So startup culture typically Are we too old? Is that what no, you're saying? that's my question. <laughs> you guys were both married when you started this. Uh -huh. You had a kid very early on in the process. You probably both have several at this point. How did that change for you? That's kind of a, a unique thing for Utah. Specifically, we're very family-oriented, get married young. Even our college kids are married and have kids. So what, what 
definitely harder for him. So um, being away for three months and shuttling back and forth, of course, is difficult. So that is a huge sacrifice on our spouses, families, et cetera, and saying, okay, is this worth it? I mean, we, at that point, we're basically all in, just like, look, this is going to be hard. And obviously, we tried to shuttle, you know, and, and see each other often, but I'm not going to say it was easy. It definitely wasn't. I think it was harder on, on Brandon um, because he does have three sort of people. So it's, it's, yeah, definitely hard on the, the family side of it. Um, we, we weren't your typical Y Combinator company. Um, I think we'll see more and more companies like us going through Y Combinator. We had already been working on our idea for over two years. We had a full product. We had paying customers. Um, and so, and obviously, you know, we have, we're married. I've got a bunch of kids. Um, not, not typical. And uh, in just our recent round of funding, that's one of the things our investor, uh, Ronnie Conway from A Capital, um, he led the round. But I remember something that he told us, we had him come meet us in our little apartment we were renting in Mountain View uh, towards the end of Y Combinator. He came and met with us. He thought we were young college students and came in and met with us, found out, you know, we're in our 30s, we're all married, a bunch of us have kids. And he said he had to do a complete 180. He had to like put the brakes on and say, what the crap? Like, this is a Y Combinator company? Obviously, he saw our vision, he saw our tenacity, he saw that we just didn't give up, um, and he saw the market potential for what we were doing. Um, so ultimately, he loved the idea, but yeah, it, it throws people kind of for a loop a little bit. Okay, let's just get a couple more questions. We'll start right here. So you focus on dental companies, but does this idea have the potential to translate to other industries? And what Definitely. other industries are you guys looking on the horizon? I mean, there's so um, we look at uh, one of the big things about dentistry is there. First of all, nobody actually loves going to the dentist. So uh, one thing they've had to work on is that relationship between the office and the patient. So if you guys can think of your dental office, and hopefully they have a good front desk staff that tries to you know build a rapport, etc. The problem with communication is it just wasn't connecting those dots. And so there are other small to medium businesses like that. And so there are a lot we've we've kind of been looking and that'll be something we'll tackle next. We're not entirely sure which one yet, but uh, I know there's definitely uh, many more verticals that we can move into. More, more really anything that uses that customer service driven type of thing. So, let's go in the blue and then this round. Yes. Yeah. Your comment on the process of going from a services company to a technology company, also focusing on uh, outsource development and bringing it in-house and what that was like. All right, so first question, going from a services company to a software company. Um, I've always loved technology and software, so I welcome that change. Um, I'm more of a, so I've got a sales background, but I also have a design background. Um, not a formal background in it, but I grew up always drawing. I got involved with computers and graphic design um, pretty early on, and I've always loved that. So going that route, was what I always wanted to do. So that was a pretty easy transition. Now, trying to outsource it and then bring it in-house, um, that, that's where it's hard. We, I didn't have the technical knowledge to develop this myself, um, nor did Jerry. And so we had to find somebody. And when you're trying to build telephone service, it's not easy. There's not very many people that know how to do that. And that's why, you know, Izeni happened to be, uh, we felt lucky. That's number four right again. Now, right Shout next out. to us. <laughs> so. We didn't know they were going to be featured, but we decided to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the love. We love you guys. All right, last question right here. Um, you guys made it to the promised land of the Bay Area. You were, you know, that's where almost all tech companies dream to be. Why did you decide to come back? I miss my kids. Yeah. So, no. they, they weren't interested in moving out there, huh? No. Um, we already had, uh, I think we were at 13 full-time employees okay. when we left to go to Y Combinator. Um, I love Utah. Grew up in Oregon, but I feel like I'm a native Utah now. Um, and I actually had, uh, had an office hour with Sam Altman and asked him that specific question. 
should we move out here? Is it going to make that big of a difference? And he said, you'll probably sacrifice some connections and some events and things like that. But he said he's a huge proponent of building companies outside of Silicon Valley. And I think it's an advantage to us. Um, there's less competition out here for talent. It's still highly competitive, but there's less. Um, it's a very different environment. And I, frankly, I love the environment out here. So. I pretty much mirror that. I mean, Utah is actually, it's growing. I mean, it's, it's a good place. Problems with fundraising? No. You guys Not a, well, well, other than he'd have to fly out or something. Okay. Yeah, just no work it out. Saying, like, they, no. they would say, well, it might be kind of difficult to get out there. We might not be able to provide you as much help. But ultimately, you know, there, there's times when you're going to want your investors' help. But most of the time, you're busy running your company, and you just need to have your nose down and get to work. And so, um, for us, it was a non-issue. For them, they brought it up as maybe a potential issue. But yeah, yeah as Brandon and Jared.